interested. Um, okay, so the agenda is uh, first we're going to start with uh, a little project status and then an overview of the early release science program by Stephanie Milon. Milon. Uh, the ERS program is a is part of the director's discretionary time uh, for UST. So it's coming out of your cycle one time per se. Uh, it's coming out of the director's discretionary pot. Um, and then Stephanie's done, we'll switch over and I'll give a whirlwind uh, overview of solar system capabilities and planning tools for JWST. And then we'll have a general discussion at the end. Um, if you want to put in about, I think it would make we did about five minutes of questions, sort of interview with the talks, and then at the end we can have about 30 minutes to discuss. Um, so hopefully that's enough. And uh, these charts are not, not right on the website, but they very soon after today's event, they posted at the URL that I just highlighted at the bottom of the slide here. Um, so there's all of our community outreach events are cataloged at that site. And for today's event, um, you find that the slides are posted. Also, uh, contact and follow up information at the bottom here. Um, so you can email myself, Steph Milon. Milon. <laughs> Sorry, Stephanie, I don't know what's my problem with your name today. Um, and then we, there's also the uh, so service help desk for JWST is in the lower right here. Uh, okay, Steph, do you want to uh, take the take the ball? I sure. Know. I did, or you want to? Yeah, I'll take it because I can't find you in the list. It's too long. Okay. Hopefully, everybody sees my slides now. So, presentation mode. Um, if you can't hear well, um, I apologize. I have to do this from my house today. Just got back from travel, but it was a great week. Uh, I wanted to give you a bit of status on uh, where we are with JWST today and an overview of the ERS program. Um, as John said, feel free to contact him or I if you have any questions about anything. There's also the help desk. Um, and John, you misspelled my email on your previous slide. So Everybody should know what the James Webb Space Telescope is by now, but if not, um, here is a one-chart overview. It's a joint partnership between NASA, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency. <clears throat> Missions being led at Goddard uh, Space, Space Flight Center. Um, our primary contractor is Northrop Grumman. We have four instruments, a uh, near-infrared camera, a near-infrared spectrograph, a mid-infrared instrument, and a fine guiding sensor. Um, all missions will be conducted at Space Telescope Science Institute, where the Hubble Space Telescope is currently being operated. Full deployable uh, infrared telescope. Uh, it's deployable because we have a primary mirror of about 6.5 meters in diameter, which does fit inside any rocket fairing to date. So to launch the spacecraft, uh, we have to fold the entire thing up so it fits inside an AN-5. Um, uh, so we can launch off to the Sun Earth second Lagrange point. Uh, it's cryo temperature. Uh, that's because it's passively cooled. We have a massive sun shield. It's about the size of a tennis court. But by having the optics and the instruments that in the shade of the sun shield, uh, we have um, a cool optical telescope that doesn't have to be actively cooled. We have a five science mission, but a 10-year goal. Um, we are really required to carry 10 years of fuel, so we should be able to operate uh, efficiently for 10 plus years. So as I just said, uh, we have a five-year requirement for the lifetime, but a 10-year goal. These are facts that I just basically said. Uh, we will be at the second Lagrange point um, and operating with a telescope temperature of about 50 Kelvin. Um, so our instruments cover wavelengths between 0.6 and 28 and a half microns. 
We have a fraction of one of two microns. This is near infrared telescope. Our capabilities offer featured filtered imaging spectroscopy, which includes slit, integral field, grism and prism, pornography, and aperture mask interferometry. There was an annual call for proposed. Um, our first call for general guest observers uh, comes out in November of this year. The release science call has actually already been released. Um, I'll talk about that briefly. We all constant real tracking up to 30 milliarc seconds per second. The pipeline is going to offer um, science quality data. We will report time critical observations and targets of opportunity um, within a 48 hour uh, response time for target of opportunity. Full data archive system that will be um, accessible even for the cycle one call. So if you plan to do archival uh, research for early release science programs, you're allowed to do that. There will be funding for geo observers, uh, uh, U.S. investigators. Uh, we cannot um, have Earth occultation. This is because we can't point anywhere towards the sun. Um, where we reside and with the restrictions of the field of regard, we have targets that are available about twice a year. And at a given time, we cover uh, about 35% of the sky. Um, uh, I guess that's in another slide. Um, I'll show you briefly why, and the anti sun is not actually visible. Back to solar system observations, um, we can do everything pretty much from Mars on out, so all the planets from Mars outward, um, their light rings, um, and also do all, almost all the small bodies in the solar system, including near asteroids, uh, KDOs, and comets, at least at some point during their it. As I said, we offer non digital tracking, so our speed limit for cycle one and for the ERS is 30 milliarc seconds per second. Um, we think that we'll be able to go faster, but we can't verify that until we're actually on sky and can test our, our track rate. And this is something I think for the fast NEOs and comets, and they're extremely close. Uh, said, we do have the opportunity to observe almost all of them at at least at one point in their orbit. Uh, we have a nonlinear ephemeris, actually represented by a fifth order polynomial, um, acquired from JPL Horizon, and jitter of about seven milliarc seconds over a thousand second integration. So we feel the uh, This just shows you the annulus that we have available at any given time. Um, as you can see, just Due to the, the constraints of the observatory, uh, the sun shield um, gives us this sort of restricted regard. Uh, I said we cover about 35% of the sky at any given time. For the system, this means that most of our observations um, are going to have to be made near quadrature, but we're used to doing these types of observations and planning, um, very similar to its or rehearsal capabilities. A brief overview of our instrumentation. Um, I like this slide because it gives you a nice general overview of our imaging capabilities through three instruments, near cam, nearest, and the mid-infrared instrument. Um, and then also our spectroscopic capabilities with um, the multi-object spectrometer, single slit, and IFU um, between all four instruments, as well as focus with waves on the bottom. The book will be made available um, after, this, after this, so if you want any more details, uh, you can chart online, and actually all the information is already on the JWST uh, web page. But here's a look at our imaging mode. Uh, with, I like this chart as well because it gives you sort of a sense of our field of view for the various modes. Uh, so for standard field view with NearCam, you can see we have about a 2.2 to 4.4 arc minute. Uh, field of view. As you mentioned, the mid and red standard imaging uh, is about one by two arc minute. Um, so other capabilities for coronography. Um, then with the other instruments, for example, for nearest, you can see that we have um, a comfortable field of view, slightly small, about half the size of near cam. Um, but some other capabilities. <clears throat> 
And then spectroscopic modes. Um, there's multiple spectroscopic, spectroscopic modes with the multi object the IFU capabilities from both the near infrared and the mid infrared, the single lit capabilities with various um, fields of view, and those capabilities. I want to say since this is this actually a, a webinar for solar system observations, if you are curious about what the uh, committee has already been thinking out to date about JWST, uh, we published a whole special issue um, in PASP last January. Um, and if you would like copies of any of those articles um, and you don't have access to them, please feel free to email me. They are also all on archive as well. Um, this gives you a nice overview of um, all the abilities of pretty much any target in the solar system um, and sort of where we're, where we're planning on going with observations. And maybe it might give you some ideas for new observations. I'm going to do a status overview real quick uh, and then talk to you about the ERS program. So uh, as of February uh, 20 or today, um, we had a very busy year last year. It was the year of the observatory assembly. The main components of the observatory were completed, including the instrument package. Um, so all our instruments were integrated and verified and finally tested as a whole. The, telescope, the optical part of the telescope was actually assembled. The pictures and the instruments and telescope were integrated into one. And the project has actually been complete. The year of testing, this is a major year for us. Um, our major components are actually going to get tested and ready for final assembly into a single unit so that we are prepared for launch in 2018. Instrument sign module looks like. Uh, you can see we have all four science instruments and the giant jumbled mess. Um, just so you get a sense of scale, there's a there's a guy on this side of the picture over here. Um, it's a nice, nice large package, and um, everything has been integrated and finalized through a final cryovac test early last year. Our installation was com completely successful. All 18 segments are shown here. Uh, this is in our clean room at Goddard. Uh, the area is also installed. Um, it looks a little bit, bit more a little different now because we've added a lot of our blanketing and the instrument module has actually been installed in the back. And this is showing you when we actually dump our telescope base down and lower the entire instrument suite into the back of the telescope. So they're fine for all of us, but um, very, very successful and the instruments have been integrated. Current, the whole telescope model, this is, has the wings folded back in this picture, um, then moved out of the clean room into a makeshift clean tent, which is what you're seeing here. The tent is being lowered over the folded up observatory uh, for acoustic and vibration tests that are currently underway at Goddard. Um, these will be conducted through the spring before the observatory is then sent down to Johnson Space Center, where the full end-to-end -end optical test will be conducted in Chamber A uh, this summer. Uh, full test to make sure we can, um, in real time, Focus and tune each of our 18 segments. 18 segments uh, to do um, a full imaging, and um, also to test some of the instruments with the optical alignment. Uh, this shows you what our pathfinder looks like in there. So this is sort of the, the the middle part of the main observatory with a few mirrors that have actually been installed. Um, so we completed successfully completed testing our test equipment that has been installed in Chamber A. Um, so the, the entire um, testing suite is now ready for our, our flight. This is what it looks like in five chamber A uh, with, with the JWT optical assembly. Our craft bus is also complete. Uh, we have um, the spacecraft as well as the sun shield now has, has been finalized. This is an image of the, the test model of the sun shield. Um, we had to build a full-scale test model so we knew how to deploy, test the deployment, also to know where to sort of pin and pull things um, so that we did get uh, light leaks or any other issues. Everything is integrated early 2018, the sun shield, the spacecraft, and the observatory. 
where we then package everything up and, and um, send it off to launch in French Guiana. And it was like folded up inside of the bearing of the Ariane 5. Finally, I'll move on to the early release science program. Um, this program has well, the official call has, is now available. You can find it on jwst-docs at sci.edu. Um, this program um, is coming out of the director's discretionary time, um, and he's allocated 500 hours for this entire program. The vision of the ERS program came about due to uh, proprietary time on guaranteed time observers and cycle one guest observers. So if you look uh, at the timeline where actual cycle one science began for both GPOs and GPOs, um, all will actually start around April of 2019. Um, all of these data have a one-year proprietary period, and, and when consider when the next call for proposals for cycle two is released, a deadline for proposals, which will be early 2019, or early December of 2019, um, there, won't, there will be very limited um, data available to the community um, before cycle two observations are actually begun, and um, there will be very limited access to data for the, for the rest of the community who are not part of GTO or DO cycle one team. For access to representative data sets in support of Cycle 2, uh, the director has actually allocated 500 hours of his, his discretionary time. So up to about 15 teams. Um, all these teams will cover all parts of the science. There's no bias towards any field. Um, and it will be reviewed through a multidisciplinary committee of experts. So just without the ERS program, the motivation and goals. So it's guided by five primary principles. Um, I'm not going to read all these in gory detail, but I will highlight um, what the principles are. First of all, the projects have to be substantive science and demonstration, and demonstration program. So we want to make sure that you're, you're showing a unique capability that's not going to be covered for general missioning purposes. And, um, have a specific interest to the broad community such that everyone will have um, access to data as well as um, have scientific merit for each of these programs. Design, create, and deliver science enabling products to help the community understand JWST capabilities. These products um, have to be delivered by release of the cycle two call for proposals, so that's September of 2019. Um, each project has to define a core team to be responsible for the delivery of these products um, according to the proposed management plan, which you have include for an ERS proposal, um, performance subject to periodic review. Actions have to be conducted early. They have to be schedulable within the first five months of cycle one. So within the time period between April and August of 2019, and the subsequent set of the observations should be schedulable within the first three months of observation. We need to be flexible to accommodate possible changes to the scheduled start of science observation. So if we have a delay in uh, launch or if commissioning takes a bit longer than we anticipate. We have no proprietary time at all. All and pipeline data uh, pipeline process data will enter the public domain immediately after processing and validation at Space Telescope Science Institute on the data archive. And um, the entry recognizes and supports the benefits of having a diverse and inclusive scientific team um, that should be involved in the formulation of ERS proposals. So there should be diverse representation of the community. Um, given subdiscipline to help ensure that the investigations are of broad interest across our community. Um, all met facilities are facilities for dissemination of JWST expertise through a more extensive network and promotes more equitable 
participation in JWST scientific discovery. I'll say something briefly about um, co versus collaborators and how that could possibly work for these proposals as well. Um, first, uh, the evaluation criteria. Um, it can be evaluated slightly uh, different from a general um, geo proposal. So, uh, these are the lines for evaluation. So, basically, they want to improve the community understanding of JWST. Um, that is things like the scientific case, the science capabilities, as well as guide a subsequent observation. The effect of writing deliverables, which include quantitative data related measurements that will support development of cycle two proposals. The which science enabling products will be developed to enrich the overall scientific return of the mission. The credit management plan, and finally, overall scientific merit. For the timeline of when everything is happening, uh, we recently released the RS call for proposal that came out at the AAS meeting in January. Your intent, which is absolutely mandatory for an ERS proposal, is due on March 3rd. The ER final call for proposals will be released in May of 20, May this year. The proposal deadline is actually August, mid-August of 2017. Um, you can have the ERS timelines actually pulled in with the GTO um, program. Uh, this is significant for you because uh, you cannot propose to do targets that are including target and observations that are included in the guaranteed time observation. The teams have to submit their proposals with a, a tentative target list in April this year which is right before the final call for proposals uh, for the RS program. Um, so we'll have some idea for what the constraints will be. Oops, sorry. Um, and then our targets for the guaranteed time observations and the target observations will actually be released to the public officially by June 15th. This is where all targets are frozen for the guaranteed time observing plan. This month, uh, uh, sorry, two months before the, DR, the ERS programs are actually due, the proposal due, so you have a couple of months to refine your proposals and target list. Uh, cycle one, official call for proposals, or the call for proposals comes in November of this year, as I said, and we do um, next spring, the so March of 2018. Uh, briefly, uh, regarding the Solar System GTO program, um, all of the GTO teams uh, that are conducting solar system observations have been working together um, not only to make sure that our observations are complementary, uh, we also um, think that it's important for the community to know what these observations are even prior to um, developing ERS programs. So, working on um, putting together a preliminary list of our targets and observations. These are going to be uh, very tentative um, with some detail about the actual observation. Um, it's finalized right now, and it should be available to the community in the next few weeks. Uh, we will post that list, not only are we posting these presentations, but probably in a few other um, sites to look out for um, email from the DPS or uh, pen. And as I said, our official list with observations are actually released uh, on June 15, 2017. Being said, if you have any specific questions regarding targets or observations, please read to get in touch with myself or John Stansbury. Um, I'd be happy to work with you or your team on um, what your target list and what your observations are. The DRS program are in the call. Um, so please go there and find it, and remember that your notice of intent is due March 3rd of 2017. I also wanted to point out there is another full proposal planning workshop uh, at the Institute in May this year, uh, 18th through 17th. So if you want even more tutoring than you get today, um, that's another place to tune in. Uh, 
Supporting missions are also currently underway through a number of programs, too, um, but I wanted to bring to your attention is the Hubble Space Telescope. I really um, emphasizing preliminary JWST observations, especially for things like the ERS program, as well as Keck Observatory through the NASA call. There are um, large early release science teams that we know of that are being worked, worked on uh, for the solar system community. Uh, one is the Jovian system. Um, that's being co-led by Amka de Pater and Deary Pute. And a small body proposal that's being led by Noemi Canelo Alonso and Thomas Mueller. Uh, if you're interested in either of those, I uh, might get in touch with um, those leads, but I think their teams are pretty tight and I don't know that their um, plans span much more than where they already are, but um, I recommend you get in touch with them directly. Uh, so if you are planning your own solar system ERS program, um, we'd be interested in, well, John Stanbury and myself would be interested in knowing uh, we're willing to help you with any of the technical parts of your proposal or your program if you're interested. Um, I don't know if you prefer to speak up now or if you'd rather just get in touch with us personally, um, either is sufficient. Uh, so I make one comment um, regarding the ER proposals uh, co for your teams, co-I versus collaborator. I will say that um, since we have a full data archive system available to cycle one uh, users, this is going to include um, any RS data that's acquired within um, goal one. Immediately, you can write a data proposal to analyze and publish ERS data. A nice way to include um, having your collaborators be more involved in data analysis as opposed to being co eyes of the original ERS program. Your um, co going to be the ones that are delivering these products these data, you know, science enabling products um, on the development of the observations. The actual analysis of the data uh, is something you might want to consider to have to include less collaborators where they can then go in and ask for funding or support through the RI program. I have, so I'm happy to take any questions and um, I know Emka is on the line and I I also saw Nomi on the line, so if we have questions or if you two want to briefly discuss what you're planning for ERS, um, um, keep interested, but if not, then that's fine as well. Are there... Yes. Uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit more about what you mean with science enabling products? <laughs> that's the heart. <laughs> Okay, so back to um, science one Okay, so these products are going to be things that help with data reduction or um, analysis and interpretation of data that um, useful for your particular community. So, for example, something like uh, a tool to stitch together near infrared and mid infrared spectra including all the calibration, such that you have one smooth full spectrum as to the two or multiple components of, of how they was acquired. Um, for the soul, we have other unique things like, like uh, how we have get our calibrated data. So if you have to do, for example, a form of shadow observation, um, how you would include that, that sort of analysis the uh, offering sort of tool for the rest of the community to use and implement for future data analysis would be something that would be very useful. The details of it are, are included in the call. Um, but if you have further questions beyond what they've included there, um, I'm happy to iterate with you and the, um, the Institute to, to verify that we're on the right track. 
Yeah, I am John Sainsbury. One, one thing that might be appropriate for you would be some sort of characterization of scattered light near Jupiter. So that'll be interesting for all the satellite observations. So that might be a possibility. Um, okay, it's good. That's one of the things that we had in mind. At least I had in mind. So. Me? Uh, you hear me? Yep. Okay. I have a couple of questions for Stephanie or for you. One, the goals are described in, in the call for the proposal, the world science is not mentioned. So I don't know which would be the weight or the balance between science and uh, proving the capabilities of the telescope, for example. So, yes. go, go. talk to the director's office. I have been told that demonstrating science and capabilities are both significant. Um, you definitely need the science, uh, the science merit of, of what you're trying to do, but also demonstrating the capabilities of JWST um, in a way that will be useful for the for the rest of your direct community or even the whole community uh, is something they're really going to be looking for. Um, last I was told, which was in January, they're looking at about a 50-50 um, price where they want. Thank you. Uh, that, uh, if I may, got it correct when you mentioned that uh, this uh, these are thoughts to show unique capabilities that will not be covered through general commissioning program. How do we know what the uh, program is covered? Uh, well, uh, John and I have presented did some overviews of commissioning at both the DPS and then at a meeting, a workshop that we had in um, my last fall. Uh, if you're curious about what those actually are, I would run looking at those charts for getting in touch with John or I. Um, but we have a very limited amount of commissioning for solar system targets. Um, scattered light, um, subarray readout, um, being a moving target. But there's a lot of other things that, sh that we could actually do for the ERS program that would be beneficial not only to the solar system community, but to other um, bright extended objects throughout the world. Okay. Okay. And fi I, uh, uh, final question. Uh, these observations will be done all through five months. And my is, can we, for a particular target, ask for a particular date or short range of dates, or we pick objects available for a week or month? Um, my advice would be to pick targets that are available for longer periods of time. Now, I know for, for especially being small bodies, that can be challenging. Um, what, what you'll benefit from by, by having a, a, a target, for example, that's available for a longer period of time is one, you don't get the overhead of time restriction. Um, so you can look in the call for what they're currently thinking for um, uh, heads for time critical observations, for example. Um, you want to avoid that if you possibly can. So you want to say, you know, you know uh, outside of a 24-hour time constraint, for example, especially for early for the ERS program. Um, you want to try to be as flexible as you possibly can, and they actually do state that in the call. They want to be flexible to accommodate possible changes to the schedule. I want to know observations on maybe some particular object that has a specific geometry, and you want to touch it at a certain moment. Yeah, which is something that, um, especially in the solar system, but if you take it as the least constraint you possibly can. <laughs> okay, thank you. I understand. <laughs> that would be my advice. 
the other was to propose if you had two or three targets that would meet a science goal, but at different times, then you could provide flexibility that way, I believe, too. Thank you. Yes, Stephanie, Thierry, she's speaking. Hi. So, uh, did we regard um, the, uh, for the principles of early, execu early execution and the fact, fact that they must have a target list which is flexible, how can we accommodate that with uh, focusing one list of uh, Jupiter? How do you? Um, trying to be challenging. Um, I, in all honesty, I think that the director and his team will be empathetic to the fact that there are some targets that are going to be available when they're available, especially things like science management. So, um, but is, is they're available for a period of time. It's not like you're trying to do everything in your entire program within one day or one observation. Uh, so being able to do that over a multi-week period is, is probably the best you're going to be able to do. Uh, and I would prioritize. You can set up your observe observations such that uh, you have that aren't necessarily time constraint being a substantial part of your proposal, and then putting less proprietary or less um, one things that are going to be much more time constraint. Question regarding the the um, the judging area. They are ranked by from one to five. Is it uh, an order which is very important? That would uh, it would weight by uh, the science. Science uh, would be only the have a rate compared to science enabling and uh, and so on in the general area. Uh, I'm sorry. Will you repeat your question? Okay. So. The question is whether the criteria are given in priority order or yeah. just a list. I think this is just a list. Okay. It doesn't have any particular order. Okay. Uh -huh. This is Thomas speaking. I have a question about the notice of intent will yes. feedback I mean um, will you inform team that they should probably merge their programs or will you give feedback that something is impossible or is, is there some feedback on the notice of intent they're not going to ask teams to merge um, in fact uh, I think they kind of like the idea that there would be um, competition, um, but at the time, I don't, I don't know if they're going to offer much feedback. I think it's more just to um, to plan for an evaluation committee. Um, they they include the right expertise on the TAC as well as. Um, <laughs> people that are included in, in ERS programs and those that are not. <clears throat> it's a really short um, document. In the, notice, in the notice of intent, what, what, what do we need to have in there except for just a list of name of people? Um, do I have any slides? Give me one second, and I can find the details of that. When we, when we come back to that one at the Q&A at the end, and I'll give some yeah. time to look up. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. okay. Question about the time constraints. 
Okay. Who's speaking? This is Wong. Hi, Mark. Uh, so I understand that uh, uh, having observations be too time constrained is not encouraged, but um, planning time observations is an important capability that, that the entire community would be interested in. So having a component of highly time constrained observations could demonstrate that. Um, is it possible that that could be seen that way or? I'm I'm going to double check on this um, whenever John's presenting. But I, off the top of my head, I think that time critical observations um, are not supported for ERS just due to the nature of the program. The time strain probably are. I just I need to look up the details. Um, no, at the end of the end of the webinar. But um. It's just, I don't know if uh, that's something going to support for the ERS program. Just because the nature of it is it has to be conducted in such an early time period. But I will offer more with you. Okay, so we move on. John? Oh, okay. back. Uh... I was showing up on the web that's fine. Okay. Yeah, for those drawing late, sorry, I'm having some kind of problem the display to allow me to go full screen, so I'll have to display this mode. Um, so, uh, for those that don't know, I'm working at Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm uh, the AWST Solar System Lead here, um, and Demi is the uh, JWST Deputy Project Scientist for Solar System Science. Um, and so, yeah, so I just want to give a this very fast uh, slide packet. Um, but after the meeting, I'll post some, especially for APT. I have a, a hour long presentation about how to use APT to plan solar system observations. Um, so I'll post some more detailed slides after this. So this will go by a little bit quickly, but hopefully not not be useless. So Stephanie pointed out there are four instruments on JWST, and this breaks this these charts show them. Uh, there's two of these. Uh, first is the imaging modes, and so instruments for imaging are NearCam, Nearus, and Miri. NearCam and Nearus are in the Point six to five micron range. Area is the five to twenty eight micron range, and they um, give uh, good good imaging quality uh, over essentially all of that wavelength range. The pixels are a little bit big at the shorter shortest wavelengths, uh, but in general, the image quality should be very good. Um, there's a mode called aperture masking interferometry in the nearest instrument. Um, this has throughput but gives you uh, half lambda over D PSF instead of end over D PSF. So, and it's over about, actually, I think about uh, 2.7 microns. Uh, and the interesting thing for things like imaging volcano on IO or other applications, there are very coronagraphic modes. Uh, we may get some use for. Uh, system science, but not a lot. The microscopy modes, um, the ones that will be um, highly with red circles, the modes are most, most interesting for solar system science, I suspect. Um, so for spectroscopy, your spec has um, some slits, and it also has a slit. The chart here shows you the um, resolving power for near spec and the slit spectroscopy. Uh, near spec. So we're working on getting implemented uh, a pseudo long slit. It'll be about uh, 200 milliseconds by 60 
or seconds long in there. It'll actually use the, um, their multi optic spectroscopy, multi shutter array uh, to do that, but it'll act mostly basically like a, a long slit. Um, and then uh, mirrors has got a 0.6 by 5 arc second slit, so not very, not very long. Um, and then that I think will be really interesting is the spec imaging modes. And so these are available both in near spec, uh, and you can use the near spec view at all, all the resolving powers that they have. Field of view is about three seconds square. Um, and then also has an IFU. Um, it's broken with separate uh, channels uh, because it has such a huge wavelength grasp, uh, you can't collect all the data at once. But it's got a resolving power, power of roughly 1,000, depending on the particular setting you pick. Um, and the um, field of view is comparable to the near spec field of view, about three or seconds across. It gets a little bit bigger at the longer wavelengths. But of course, full coverage, full spectral coverage of the entire field of view at the longer wavelengths. So you can think of the IFUs is giving roughly a three arc second square uh, spectral cube on your target. Uh, these are a few charts that just uh, demonstrate the sensitivity we expect to get from JWST, and each of them, the JWST sensitivity curves are shown uh, at, at the bottom in this um, sort of sign color. And so for um, photometric sensitivity, uh, JWST will do significantly better than Hubble at all, all wavelengths except at the very, very short end. Um, uh, incredibly better than uh, ground-based observatories. Uh, and at the uh, lower wavelengths, it will also considerably outperform what Spitzer was able to do. Not surprising, but good to see. The well, medium resolution spect spectroscopy, so this is roughly uh, resolving power of 3,000. Uh, uh, and so, uh, the near uh, sensitivity is uh, one and a half of magnitude better than you can do from the ground, and mirrors Spitzer by uh, the same factor, uh, depending on wavelength. But huge gains in sensitivity over what's been available in the past. Um, there's also low resolution spectroscopy modes. Uh, again, JWST is really the king of sensitivity. So if you have faint targets or faint line emission uh, that you want to try and pick out, it may be very well for you. Uh, we'll come back to that question about the flip side of being super sensitive uh, a little later in the talk. So to Go over Stephanie touch base on some of these points, but I'll just reiterate them quickly. So the WST field of regard is from 85 degrees solar elongation to 135 degrees. It can rotate around the sun observatory line 360 degrees. So you've got that annulus on the sky. Um, your target has got to be within the annulus in order to be seen by the observatory. And this is a constraint to keep the telescope behind the, the sun. Um, you're in a quadrature, not at opposition. And you can't observe anything that's inside Earth's orbit, essentially. Um, this uh, is an idea of the coordinate systems and the layout of the JWST focal plane. Uh, for options that are near the ecliptic plane. So, so like most observatories, we have instrument uh, fields of view that are scattered around the focal plane. Uh, we don't you know, switch switch out. Uh, you just repoint the telescope to use a different instrument. Uh, and so this is where the uh, near spec is the 1 to 5 micron spectrometer. Near is the 5 to 20 micron instrument with spectroscopy and imaging. Near narrowly imaging. Uh, six to five microns. And now uh, the gas is, uh, provides guiding. Uh, this is the fine guidance sensor. And you can see that the FGS fields of view are essentially the same as the near cam fields of view. And 
they're very closely associated with the insurance fields of view. So that that's a bit in the way HST was. HST had the guiders quite away from the instrument fields of view. Depending on whether you're looking in the direction that JWST is traveling or looking in the direction USC just came from, um, you uh, uh, fields of view of the instruments flip around on the sky. And also, there are little data that illustrate how the PSF uh, diffraction spikes are oriented in this uh, sort of near bit geometry. We indicated that we have been with moving target tracking. Um, this rate is uh, good enough to track MERS at its highest parent rate. Um, the great thing about having that implemented is that once you get the moving target, it's fixed on the detector. And so it becomes a fixed target when you're in moving target tracking mode. Um, and once you get that, I send all of the, the um, all of that works very well. Somebody that just joined should be uh, to mute themselves. Let me see. So that, as I mentioned, the big, the big benefit of, of moving target of tracking the target is that once you do that, the, everything works essentially as it does for fixed targets, including the data pipeline. Um, some details of how the guider works: uh, we have, we have to use slightly brighter guide guide stars for when we're in moving target tracking mode, um, but that should be a big Hit for essential observations. Um, only at high galactic latitude should that um, perhaps uh, keep, keep observing at specific times, but if you are flexible about when you need to observe, it won't have any impact on it all. And we'll be able to uh, support quite long observations. Uh, individual exposures of roughly an hour should be possible. And if you need more data, you know, more exposure time than that. You would get up into multiple exposures in the system will switch ours as needed. <laughs> so, in terms of uh, tracking limit, the 30 milli arc second per second, milli arc second limit, this uh, summarizes histograms of how fast comets move in the upper left, near comets move in the upper right. Uh, main belt asteroids in the lower left and KBS and centaurs in the lower right. And the um, cumulative curve, which is for comets shown in this gray uh, gray line that uh, integrates up, three milli arc seconds per second, you're able to observe any comet on any given day with a, a greater than a 90% probability. So, so that's pretty, it's not that good. For um, base, but it's very good. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, ability. You, for instance, many as you you won't necessarily be able to observe them when they're at their closest to the observatory. On the other hand, because JWST is so sensitive, you may not need to. Uh, and so this. Produce much of a much of an impact on our ability to do any of the science. Um, so we'll basically, do any comet just any time. Uh, so question about the diffraction spike and yeah, diffraction spikes is parallel to the ecliptic plane if you're pointed in the ecliptic near the ecliptic. So yeah, that's what this this figure is showing. Um, okay, so it's just showing uh, 
the NIR uh, focal plane, most of the NIR spec focal plane, and they have four micro shutter uh, quads. And so these got uh, zillions and zillions of little micro shutters that you can open to do multi object spectroscopy. Um, um, we're currently implementing uh, uh, a song slit where we open an entire column of shutters in one of the quadrants. Uh, so you long slit spectroscopy on comets and the like. <laughs> The problem is that, that in order to target act on an isolated point source with near spec, the only way to do that is to put it into this little aperture that's shown with the red bar here. It's one second square. So, in order to do that, very well known ephemeris for your target. So, this is going to work for, for new covered. Um, even some objects that have been around for quite a while can have a person certain pieces that are much larger than that. So, you need of your various uncertainty when you're proposing to put those into uh, for observations and get geometry for them if necessary. Once, uh, once you do that target acquisition and that aperture, will be a target to any of these other slits. The song slit or you know, IFT and we're pointed in the few apertures since it's three arc seconds square. Many cars should be able to land in there pretty easily. Excuse me. Uh, I also mentioned that. Uh, this uh, special issue, so um, you can find it at the IOP Science site. If you go to the jwst.stsci.edu um, and with the Science Corner, uh, you'll find uh, links to the archive versions of these papers, or you can look in archive for these authors that are listed here. There are two volumes, 959 and 960. 960 has one paper by uh, Jim Norton, but it's a nice broad overview of J JDOSD capabilities. And then this um, 11 papers on it, including much material I'm presenting here, the solar system capabilities, but then also all the science applications are covered as well in quite a bit of detail. Um, this is just mind you the four instruments again, so near imaging 0.6 to 5 micron and near spec 0.75 micron spectroscopy, near 8 micron imaging, and with this high spectral resolution mode called AMI. Um, some entering out a few years ago, um, you actually image very bright objects with JWST. Um, you have to be a little bit careful and you can't do it at all wavelengths and on all filters, but this is the saturation limits for near cam filters, um, you know, filters, medium band filters, and then a few narrow band filters relative to the uh, different for Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter, and Mars. And these are uh, the saturation limits for subarrays, which have high saturation limits than if you're taking a full frame image. Um, and so you get, with these rays, which are actually large enough to encompass the entire disk of Jupiter, you can image in a lot of bands without saturating. Um, and there are smaller subarrays that you could map around with if you wanted to use some of the other filters. Um, Leaf webs. Done a little bit of looking at the MIRI uh, resolution spectrograph. This is the MIRI IFU um, bright limits for Jupiter and Saturn at the MIRI wavelengths. So here we're looking at 5 to 28 microns. So better imaging, imaging bright limits in a fairly small subarray are shown by these horizontal bars. So imaging yields saturate uh, quite a bit. 
but the medium resolution spectrometer, you can do some really interesting spectroscopy, at least out to about 11 or 12 microns. For Saturn, it's a little bit bigger, so you can go out to around 15 microns with the sticker and do it at uh, a few more bands. And the is even better than the Uranus. Uh, they are quite a bit fainter, and so you can do both imaging and medium resolution spectroscopy all the way from the 28 microns on those two objects. KBOs, uh, sensitivity of JWST, and so uh, this is just showing our sensitivity limits in a one second exposure versus predicted spectra for, uh, you know, for KBOs at 45 AU, so outer Kuiper Belt objects. Um, and basically, the bottom line is that you can do narrow parameters for any, any non KBO. Uh, you near cam uh, in a reasonably short integration time. Yeah. To see if I can find out who needs to be muted. Yeah, mute. Okay, thank you. You're muted now. Um, and then a similar plot, but for near spec spectroscopy, so the Activities for near spec are shown in these sort of mighty swoosh stripe um, curves. The prism mode that actually goes from 0.75 microns in one shot and for resolving power of 1000 and for resolving power of 2700, you have to take the data in three pieces. But these are the predicted spectra for um, Pluto. Uh, how extrapolated to longer wavelengths, uh, which I think is just a copy of the Haumea spectrum, but extended to the right or scale directly for Orcus's size and distance and error. And so this idea of the kind of um, spectroscopy you can do on some of those KBOs, but that resolving powers that are um, Quite, and this is a 1,000 second exposure. So, if you wanted to go longer, you could push this a bit. Um, and, uh, we can get um, reasonable spread of probably out to four microns or so before it gets too faint to go after. But uh, if you're smaller but closer in, you can use these uh, near spectroscopy to characterize their it's uh, quite easily and fairly quickly. Uh, and then uh, just the last example I have for today is uh, the MIRI imaging uh, sensitivity on the 1,000 second uh, tens of sensitivity are shown as the horizontal bars for the MIRI filters. And then for a KBO, at 410% of you know, 1,000 diameter and 250 kilometers diameter. So, so you can relatively uh, uh, get other temperatures for uh, KBS using MIRI and imaging mode. And that will we'll work back. Have, uh, supporting data at longer wavelengths here, you're very uh, sensitive to um, thermal inertia. And orientation and things like that, which can be interesting, but without a long data point to tie down, it makes it rather rather difficult. But so, in case you didn't time to cut down those uh, URLs earlier for the PA special issue, I just wanted to repeat those here. Um, I highly recommend reading. If you're going to propose for using JWS, <clears throat> so a bit about the data pipeline. Um, so for job, there are going to be three uh, data problem levels. The first level one is basically what you might consider raw data. So it is fit in 
we are so that it uh, is in a consistent orientation on the sky. For the grids, we add some uh, information that's needed in the stages. Uh, basically, it's a W world coordinate system that tracks the co-moving frame for the target for that observation. Um, then level is uh, calibrate single exposure count images. So that at this point, the data is still in the um, coordinates or pixel format. Um, we apply conversion, uh, do wavelength cal. Those are all parts of the level two processing. And then at level three is when you're taking the level two products. So if you've got multiple exposures, multiple multiple near near space or spectrometer things, and you would be finding those and extracting spectra and co-adding in the prep frame doing and that's high level data product. Um, as I said, the um, at the soldier level because we're tracking the science target is fixed in the detector frame so we can essentially use the entire rest of the pipeline. Uh, with very fair modifications at that point. Um, so essentially the same kind of data that people that are observing fixed targets do. And then uh, we're going to be adding this moving to target world coordinate system data. Um, the pipeline will be able to do all the addition of exposures in the co-moving frame of the target. Um, this is something that HST servers have never had. Uh, so we add on for an improvement that's being developed for J JWST, and hopefully it will be put back to HST data at some point in the future. Um, and this is based on the uh, pipeline uh, approach that was used by Spitzer and Herschel firms, which is very well understood. It's actually pretty easy to implement. John? Yeah. Uh, can I ask you a quick question about the yeah. early line products? Yeah. To a mess, but it kind of got garbled. Do you know if there be a detailed discussion about the noise estimates and characterizations uh, coming out of uh, the level one and level two products? So one can sort of robustly trace through as of uh, point to point uh, signal to noise in the extraction. I think the answer is probably yes. Um, the way in the visible community or that do spectroscopy where it's dominated by instrumental effects, rely on noise models or noise characterization of the instrument itself in order to calculate. Signal to noise at that. And we're even operating in the band limited or photon limited, um, where those are fairly minor, and so you can actually just make this, the noise from the data itself. But um, I think for near in certain filters and for near specs, certainly it'll be dominated by the instrumental effects, and the, the data will contain and plan to appropriately capture the. Those for you. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is Gordy. Hi. Yeah. Um, your CRC second slit. Will that be available for the time period of the ERS, or or, or we can't we can't propose something that that might not yet be available. Um, it's it's on Harry Edge. I'll, I'll put it that way. I I'm not sure that, that we're going to make it. We're trying hard, um, but there are things that are um, fixed and in order to support the GTO and the ERS calls. And so I'm not sure that that's going to make it. Probably focus on the you know on, on the short splits that will be available then. Yeah, you can do is um, send a desk 
any queries about that? And then that will, uh, um, and that people are interested in that specific question. I make a note of it as well, but. That would help comet people as well as, you know, giant okay. planet observers. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, I just want to present a few slides about the uh, Astronomer's Proposal Tool, or APT. Um, I think that uh, after this um, webinar, I'll be posting additional chart packets um, that you'll be able to find at this URL, and then you can find out um, an event for today's webinar. And uh, within a week or so, we should have uh, charts posted there, and I'll finally post a a fairly short packet about how to use APT to define moving targets. And it will include some examples of setting up a few um, templates, which is more general, but um, it would be useful for people. Before we move on to APT, uh, Matt Hedman had a good question in the chat about scattered light. Oh, I'm not, I don't have the chat up right now, so. I think that already, John. About the diffraction sparks. Yeah, they shouldn't have diffraction spikes. Yeah, there is one of them that's parallel to the ecliptic district. Let's catch up. So, um, about yeah. diffraction spikes, is there, you said there's a five degree um, degree of freedom. Would that include um, a role? to remove that? Could do that, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so there was a question from Wes Frazier. Is there an update to ephemerides a few weeks before the organization? So let me come to that in a minute. Um, no, you just asked. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So I think we're caught up on the chat. Let me uh, so let me go on into APT and Wes. If I have a question, just speak up and remind me. Again. Okay. Uh, APT is what you're using to design JWST observations, and it's been in use for a long time for HST. It's the same tool. Um, where you define your targets. Um, there are a couple different kinds. Basically, there are standard targets, which are planets, or planets, satellites, longitudes on planets, things like that. And then there are uh, common asteroids uh, that you find separately. Um, find the target. You define an observation um, by picking an instrument and then picking a science template, such as imaging or IFP spectroscopy. Uh, target acquisition within the template, uh, and then you define exposure specifications, basically filters and exposures within the template. And then you impose constraints on those observations once you've done that. Um, you can constrain them by time, you can constrain them by separation from another body if you're interested in satellites. Apparently, uh, phase angle, heliocentric distance, or and different constraints are available in APT for moving targets. And that's our HST. So was one method of using APT for JWST as well. Uh, we'll show you uh, visibility windows for your targets when your target's going to be in the field of regard of JWST. So those are periods of roughly 45 days twice a year. So I'll tell you that. And it's all cool that you'll uh, eventually end up using submit your proposal. So the, you find a cover page, you attach your PDF file, fairly standard stuff for space observatories. Uh, it's available at apt.stsci.edu at any time. So, so you can you can use APT right now to create JWST proposals. We're doing this for commissioning observations. 
uh, for instance. And the um, uh, way you do that is you open AP and then you click on document, uh, AWST proposal. And then if you do that, you get an interface that looks like what's shown here. here. And yeah, that's just cover page at the top. And the more for us happens if you go down into targets and observations. Uh, navigation panel at the left uh, that allows you to switch back and forth between different parts of the proposal. Um, so here it's a lot of capabilities from HST. The level one types of uh, target are a standard target or a comet or an asteroid. Uh, and then once something that's been added is that there's an interface to the horizon system at JPL now so that you don't have to uh, enter targets by hand. Uh, so I'll that in a little bit more detail in a second. And then the important thing is that specific target is really the only thing that's different from specifying any JST observation. Once you've said, I'm going to observe a moving target, that's all you have. And then you're able to use all the instrument templates just like anybody else can. And it's supposed to work, and the pipeline's supposed to work. So <laughs> we're trying to make sure all that happens uh, by cycle one. Uh, if you the targets, there are various types of targets that you can uh, define, ways to define them. Uh, they have target resolver, or you can just put in a fixed target R and deck. New system target is what you'll want to use mostly. Um, and if you click a button, it takes you to where you can type in the name of your target, say what kind of a target it is, say something, and then you have to uh, select one type. So this would be an asteroid, a comet, or a standard target. Standard or the planets, etc. And that uh, and then you end up on a page that looks like this. And if you type in the name of the target in this search box at the top and hit the search button, it will up your it'll be the Horizon database and show you. The Vmail all of the matches for whatever you typed in to the search box. And so if you want to look at Sedna, you're done. You just click OK. Um, the next, you uh, click this little box that says Use Horizons for Orbit Element Retrieval. It'll I'm sure you really want to do that. That's sort of waste time because at this point, there's nothing in these other boxes. But in general, you're going to want to say OK. And once you do that, it populates all of the um, orbital directly horizons. And at this point, uh, target uh, or when your observation is uh, close to being scheduled or uh, you've been on that you need to check your orbital elements, you would just come into your build, click this button. And I leave the orbital elements for you again. So that hopefully answers part of Wes's question earlier. And if you want to uh, this, but then all in slight changes to these, you would simply unclick the users box here. These will come unread out, and you can edit them directly at that point if you wish to do that. Um, In that particular set, it's up to the investigator to pay attention to when their observation is scheduled. This is an ongoing battle. Um, you think the you know when they upload the commands in the spacecraft that they would check and confirm the latest ephemerities? I've made that recommendation many times. Um, so if, if you agree with me that that's the way it should work, you might um, send a help desk to it and express that opinion. People can be involved in that help desk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's start a Twitter account. Can have a can have a uh, see if you can bring on the help desk server. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I I think um I think if they got six such help desk inquiries it would be obvious that there was a move a movement of the foot. Now, there's not a lot not a lot of JWC help desk traffic coming in, so it would it would get it would be noticed. Yeah, at the end of the, the charts, I'll, um, I'll bring up that, those slides that have the resources listed, and one of those is the help desk address. Uh, let's see. Okay, standard targets. Uh, so if you wanted to observe Callisto, Callisto is a standard target. It gets a little bit complicated, but basically you would pick level one standard target and then would kick you into a another little place where you would say you would pick Jupiter. So the level one if you Callisto, the level target for your observation is Jupiter. Once you've done that, you can go level two definition and I pick Callisto. So that means you're actually going to be observing Callisto. Um, so it's a little different than the, the other stuff. But once it's stumbled through a couple times, it's not too hard. Um, the charts, the more extensive chart back that will um, uh, okay. So, okay, the last thing I was going to say just a little bit about is the exposure time calculator or the ETC. And it's not moving targets. Uh, so what is it? It's, uh, it's different than probably any ETC that you've used before. These are fairly standard tools. There are ETCs for HSD. There is one for Sophia. There is one for Spitzer. There is one for Herschel. But the USC one is it's a little bit different. So it's got a, a web-based um, GUI interface uh, that's quite complicated. I'll show you in a minute. Um, it's all the throughput and noise components that we're able to characterize and know about. Um, the unique, unique aspects of it is that it's scene-based. Um, so it does its calculations basically in pixel, in you know, the pixels of a of a a detector. So if you want to know um, exposure time for a photometry option, it's going to show you a picture of the scene with a PSF in the middle of it and show you the noise that you're achieving on each pixel in that scene. So you get the noise ratio. And then uh, you also uh, specify a measurement method. So, for instance, you can define an aperture for the optometry, and it'll also report the SNR in that aperture. Um, I'll say that it's a complicated tool to use. It's not intuitive um, and takes some practice. So, I recommend that you find me to spend some time using it. Uh, the help. Actually, I think the ETC has got its own help function. It's a separate thing from the uh, help demo. But once you launch it, you can uh, request uh, directly through the ETC. And have any specific capabilities at this point for moving targets. So it does not know your target is going to be in the sky. It can't tell you how, it can't for changing observed distances. Uh, of time, yeah. those sort of things. So it basically is intended for fixed time or to move it, use it for moving targets. You have to be and figure out to convince to uh, moving target observation. And to use it, uh, well, the other thing is that you'll be required to use it to justify your proposal time request. Uh, really much option to using it, at least at some level. Um, I'm going to try to explore some options 
for some flexibility about that, but I can't make any promises uh, to use it. You'll need to create what's called a MIST, M I S T account, um, which is going to be used for the archive. And maybe for the help desk, do you need to? Yeah, so if you put in help, help to the regular help desk, you'll also use your MIST account for that. Um, it works on the basis of workbooks, so you can create a bunch of workbooks for yourself that have capture examples or useful examples or that are specifically for a given proposal. A work, workbook can contain multiple themes and targets, uh, multiple measurements, uh, observing modes, and you can do those with others that are on your proposal team. And the uh, the UPTC is shown at the bottom of this slide. John, what capability permit a batch process run ETC? No. No. There uh, can, which can be run separately, and at the moment, I don't know, maybe Stephanie can comment on this. I are people within the institute that can access the back end. It's called Pandia. And, uh, but I'm not sure what plans are for making that available to the community within. So it would, it would help if we could do that for moving targets. Um, yeah, from almost. Yeah. Um, it should be. Yeah, I agree. Who, who's speaking? Sorry. Say again. Yeah. Say again. It's asking right. a question about batching. Yeah. I just last week that Pandeya is indeed available publicly. Oh, except okay. URL is cannot be found to you, to you in Google or anything. So okay. it's pub difficult to okay. plus I found the documentation just yet, but I haven't read really <laughs> it. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so check if you if you could submit a help desk uh, for that, that would probably help us push it on the um, Once you're into the ETC, this is sort of the where you would. This is the landing page. Um, this is for for my. Uh, and there are all workbooks that are available. So at the bottom, there's this button that says "Get a copy of sample workbooks." And in there, you'll see one workbook, which is uh, small examples. That I, just a couple examples that I put together. And then is the level where you can share a workbook with. Other use. So if you click on this workbook in your list here, you can have multiple workbooks listed up here. You can click on one and then you can share it by user email. And as long as you have a missed account, it will um, allow the workbook as well. And you can give uh, view permissions or edit permissions. Uh, it's a little bit of granularity there. And then there are type observations that will be as well. As I mentioned, all you have to do is change the target type to a moving target, and any of these other example workbooks would uh, work for you. So this is uh, once you're inside that workbook, there are several tabs. There's a calculations tab, a scenes and sources tab. This is where you Tell it what source you're looking at. I want to look at. You can have your own spectra. Uh, um, and uh, so the leftmost, this, this uh, leftmost pan is the scenes. And so I have one scene, which is just an asteroid. I have a second scene, which is a comet nucleus plus a coma. Within that scene, I have actually this is shown in the middle panel here are the sources for all and so you see the nucleus 
is one and two. The client is only in scene two. If you one of those, then you can go to the editor panel over to the right and define how bright that source is going to be. Uh, find it as a point source or a, an elliptical source, and, and for the um, that, uh, it's actually constructing is displayed in the lower left. Uh, flipped off. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but you can see we've got a couple of coma components. One is reflected light. One is thermal. And this is you the extent of those uh, components. Uh, in the, and the highlighted in yellow is the nucleus, which is the one that I've got highlighted in the source selection panel in the middle of the top. Uh, it also show you the source spectrum. If you select multiple sources up in here, it will overplot all of those. Uh, it will not sum them, I don't believe. The signal noise calculation, it will it will actually sum them. So it, in the noise calculation, it's per pixel. So whatever source contributing to a pixel contributes to noise for that pixel as well. In the spectrum plot, it doesn't do the summation. It just shows you the components. Anyway, it's, it's a tool. I think there's some uh, materials prepared for this fairly soon. Uh, they're not available yet. Um, example workbooks are there, so you can at least play with those. Uh, you probably want to have a webinar, webinar that's just dedicated to using the ETC. Um, and I'd happy to try and support one of those just for the solar system community. Uh, there will also probably be other well, there are, um, outreach community. Sammy mentioned one coming up in May. Um, um, if you go to jwst.stf.edu without just go to the OSC homepage slash events, um, you can look in there for workshops that are coming up and so I contain ETC training, which because it doesn't have anything specific for moving targets, it will it should be useful for you anyway just to get some practice using the ETC. Um, but we certainly in our ability of having a dedicated uh, solar system uh, where the ETC as well. Um, one of the one of the dumb things about the ETC, <laughs> ETC in a way is you can do screen captures because even on a Mac the layout is larger than the screen. And so this is this shows the largest screen capture I was able to do on a Mac, MacBook Pro. And in order to see the rest of the screen, you have to, you have to scroll through it uh, down within the ETC screen. Um, so there we can do a training video, which would allow us so with a hands-on demonstration, do a webinar, everybody can run the ETC at the same time and work through some examples. Um, um, yeah. No, I mean, you said that to submit the proposals, we will have to use the ETC. Yeah. To use it. And this is going to work for the August deadline for the ERS. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yeah. Okay, so you were asking in your last proposal, the one that is after this, if it is convenient to train in now or wait for cycle one, I would say to do it now, not now this month, but between now and July probably, so that in the preparation for the ERS, we, we know how to use it. Okay.
Okay, yeah, I see Brian uh, sent out a link to the JWSD help desk, which is a little bit uh, easier to remember than the one that I had provided. Um, so, I, we, yeah, we obviously have to find a way to get people over them on the ETC so that they can use it for themselves. Um, I, I'm all we to convince a project to provide standard sensitivity curves for reference exposure time that people then could scale themselves. Um, and we could um, For moving trouble to get them to just show one C run that uh, shows how shows their sensitivity estimate a group of what the ETC gives for that target, but then for every target in your, in your sample. So, so for some flexibility there, so there's not not good support for moving targets built into the EC at this point. Um, and easier for people. Uh, I think that's all I've got. We're down to 15 minutes. Um, the PSP link is here. APT link is here. There's the that's not complete, but there's quite a bit of it. And we're working on a moving target page in the user documentation area. So people are, are beyond the two things that Sammy mentioned are thinking about forming ERS teams. Um, feel free to and ask for help. Uh, comfortable letting us know. It's just for us to know who's working on these proposals, interested in proposing, just uh, for conversations with management and stuff here. So if you're comfortable letting us know that, that's that'd be good. Great. I open it up to general questions at this point. Stephanie, you, you I'm, uh, I wanted to go back to what Emka was saying, asking about what's included in the NOI. Right. Um, uh, okay, so the NOI submission um, is required. It's been kept confidential. It includes your proposal title, the name, email address, and affiliation of the PI and up to two co-PIs, as many co-PIs as known at the time of the submission and as many collaborators as known, and of anticipated proposal, less than 300 words. Um, it includes the proposed types of observations and science school how the proposed project supports CDRS goals and principles. Oops. Uh, also included is the observing plan and specified APT template proposal narrative. Um, the pages for items one through four, which includes the rationale for selection as a DD ERS program, your signification, the scope of the observation, data product analysis and product delivery plan, and then finally, you need a project management plan and a preliminary budget. I've used to my chart package, so they will be there. Okay. Can I talk about the questions? Since I'm assuming and I would like to confirm with you. Uh, it seems that there will be some flexibility with the, the conformative teams from the NOI to the deadline of the proposal, people that may go now to I and to the collaborator and so on. Is that correct? You can change your final list. They want as many people, though, as you possibly can confirm. Okay. I think it's we can set the um, tag. Yeah. Thinking about who they can put on the tag. Okay. 
for the list of targets, for example, if, uh, for the proposal in August, you already provide a list of targets that you want to accept. But I guess from that moment, to the beginning of the ratios, there could be some flexibility also with targets that maybe, if they are better determined by observations, you could include and take other out or things like that. Um, you can. So I, I don't think they're going to be as hard on you about target selection because you don't know what the G targets are just yet. Um, but it'd be a good idea to have you know a general overview of what you're thinking. There's flexibility when you submit your proposal. I mean. You can have multiple targets and say you could observe one or three of the a list. But just remember, every target you list or name in an ERS proposal, regardless if it's actually completed as an observation, will restrict that target from being observed in any geo proposal with the station. Okay, good to know. So, we'll see would be okay maybe we we don't include this subject in the original tar list in august but it was 2017 to april 2019 we want to include it do you think that would be possible from if you can send me sort of a brief description of weighing and how you want to implement it, I can iterate with the, the director's office. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and I did look up, um, so time critical observations are allowed in the ERS program, but top opportunity are not. The, um, use micro shutters as a long slit. Yeah. So if, um, it, that implies that the dispersion direction is on uh, the axes of the micro shutter array. So are we limited that only one uh, uh, micro shutter aperture can be open per row, or can you have multiple open per row? Um, if it's on the dispersion mode that you pick, I think. In the prism mode, it doesn't disperse it over a lot of pixels. The, and you have multiple ones open at R of a thousand. The high dispersion mode, then you have you're restricted to one per row. Um, failed open shutters. So you have that issue, but there, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so you get some of that piece of your um, slip. Yeah, a good question. I'm not that familiar with the, the near tech capabilities and the details of MS planning. They have a there's a whole separate tool T dead configuring the MSA. Um, and I'm not I'm not getting into that at all. That's the NOI backup. So look at that. Uh, yeah, and if you want to give me the, all right, take it. We're here. I, I have it right here. Um, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, here, this is a where you notice some intent. Yeah, okay. Link, or do you want the the the, the things that Stephanie just mentioned? <laughs> yeah, I can project that. Hold on. Let's get an overview of what they want. Uh, and then This page. 
So this is very good. So this is what's included in the NMI. So you have a approximately 300 word overview of your proposal. Proposed types of observations and goals. How the project supports the ERS goals and principles. Like a pretty short um, NOI. It's mostly just to make sure that they include the right people on the TAC. I had the impression that you mentioned that APTs had to be already included. So that's. No, it would be for the final proposal. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be misleading. Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Their questions or comments. Uh, most importantly, does anybody want a follow up to this? <laughs> it's not ERS follow up anyway. Happy to. Thanks. So, the, um, the links to our presentations and our slides from the DPS that we had last fall. So there's a lot of uh, details that were included, but also um, a little bit more thorough APT and ETC demos um, and overview of what's going on for commissioning if you're interested. Thank you, Stephanie. It was in the internet. Thank you. Yep. Okay, well, feel free to John I if you have questions. Um, I'm, there's two teams that are working really hard on getting ERS proposals done, and if any of you else are, are also playing, um, let us know, John or I know, if you need any help with anything. Um, not co eyes of any of these teams, so uh, we're volunteering our knowledge service to uh, working on these. All right, thank you. I think we're done. Um, so hopefully we'll get a couple more proposals coming in as well. And there will be keep an eye on the DPS email exploder and the pen email exploder for announcements. We'll try and ET webinar in a month or something. Um, and go from there. Oh, mentioned that we're there is a, a two and a half day workshop planned at Telescope uh, number fifteen or seventeen, I think, and at S Tech in the Netherlands, December fifteen through seventeen, for uh, one of observation uh, proposal planning. Um, so if you're interested in cycle one proposals, we'll have two and a half, two, two and a half day workshops where you can come and get some hands-on experience with APT, ETC, and have a little science talk stuff too. November 13 through 15, and December 15 through 15. And if you're interested, the user committee is um, open for applications until February 14th, and they really would like some solar system people. That's true. Great to have a solar system person on the uh, science users committee. To the call uh, on the chat as well. Okay. 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 All right. Thanks. Leave these chart up for a couple of minutes in case anybody wants to get any of the URLs or anything. But we'll talk about. Yeah. Thanks, bye. Yeah. Yeah.